Now recording. So, there's a test this week. Don't worry, it's just a test. What? Eh, what? Just yeah, it's just a test. Uh, we are going to have three tests in this class. Um, this will be the first. I believe we do them week five, week ten, and then the final. Could be wrong about that, but I think that's how it goes. Um, so, this, uh, this week has been set aside for test review. So we are not going to cover any new material this week. We are instead going to review old material, which I'm sure everybody's like, Yeah, okay, any other 
questions? Any relevant questions? <laughs> I mean, don't get me wrong. I love our improv and chit chat. Um, so, this is a review session. So, in order to review stuff, we need to know what we are reviewing. And we're going to do one of those active lesson things that I personally despise. We are going to collaboratively come up with what the topics we were, that we've covered so far have been. Um, if, you, if you're asked to do this about a topic that the teacher hasn't actually done in class or instructed, you know, it's like the blind leading the blind. But uh, if this is something we actually have done before, then this is a recall activity. So, not to bore you with pedagogy, topics. What have been the major topics? If statements. Let's call that conditionals. What else? methods and then oh like um, like the structure the indentation structure yeah just like I'll put that one under syntax Immediately, 
as it is implicit in all of the other ones. Syntax. Syntax is not a specific topic in and of itself. You need to know uh, the rules of syntax for the specific thing that you're doing, right? If, you know, if you're talking about conditionals, you need to know the syntax for the if statement. If you're talking about switch case, you need to know the syntax for a switch case. Right? So syntax itself, uh, not a separate topic. It's too integral to all of the other topics. So, um, good. This is a pretty chunky list. So, where should we start? Vectors. Okay. So, Nope. 
wait, 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 hold on, hold on. Oh man. It's gotta be on for me to play a sound effect. Uh, wait. <laughs> One second. that I need a soundboard. So, that's okay. That's primarily for comedic effect. I think no less. Okay. Um, how do you convert between magnitude angle and component vector? Stuff you learned in high school. Say a little louder. Trigonometry. Yes. So to get from here. To here, you use trigonometry, SOHCAHTOA, trig identities. How do you get the magnitude? Hmm? Isolate? Say again? Correct. You get from here to there with Pythagoras. A squared plus B squared equals C squared. Note that this is, in fact, a right angle triangle. This is the theta that you're looking for, and this is the magnitude. Just simple triangle geometry. Right? Again, it's a bit more complicated in three dimensions, but for now, this will be fit. This will be simple. Yes? Uh, no. I was just about to get to a unit vector. So, when we perform ray casts, um, not the debug rays, but the ray casts, um, one of the ways that you specify the ray cast, because a ray cast, um, if you don't specify a magnitude, it will just continue on in one direction forever, right? So. It's still using vector threes, right? But it uses the vector three to indicate a direction rather than care about the magnitude. So can anybody tell me what a unit vector is? What is a unit vector? from 
a regular vector to a unit vector. Let's say I have this vector here. How do I get a unit vector out of it? Pythagoras. Yeah, you're on the right track. Reciprocal Pythagoras. Or, to put it in layman's terms, if you take a vector and divide its magnitude by its magnitude, you get a magnitude of 1. And it works on components as well. If you take the components of the vector and divide them by the magnitude of the vector, you will get all of the components to be some value between 1 and 0. This results in a unit vector. Sound good? And how do you extend Pythagoras to calculate magnitudes in three dimensional space? No, you don't use. Uh, oh, wait, wait, wait. No. Um, no, you don't use trig instead. If you want to extend Pythagoras in three-dimensional space, let's remind ourselves what it looks like in two-dimensional space. A squared plus B squared is equal to C squared, right? How do you extend this for three dimensions? Anybody remember? We did a whole derivation. Anybody want to guess? I promise I won't play the noise this time. Yes? A squared plus B squared plus C squared. Yes! Or, you know, this naming convention becomes kind of obsolete. Oh, actually, get rid of that squared. What am I doing? Magnitude is equal to x squared plus y squared plus z squared. Yes, you just add an extra thingy here. There you have it. Good. I think that we have covered everything that there is to cover with respect to vectors, aside from how you create them in Unity. Yes? Should we be bringing Pythagoras? Are we going to have to do the trig to Pythagoras? Or is it going to be like the combination? I'm more interested in you being able to program than you being able to calculate trig. It's not, of course, a trig. But, um, I will allow calculators if you bring them. So, um, you shouldn't need a calculator, but if you want a calculator as a safety blanket, you can bring a calculator. So, um, so how do we declare a vector in the C sharp Unity scripting? Yes. Vector three equals not a float, it's a vector three.
creates a new vector of a new vector object. Make sense? Sometimes you'll just drop this much in if you don't want to create a variable with it. But um, this is the way that you create a new vector object. This is the way that you assign that to a new variable of the same type. Make sense? So far, so good. All right. Any further questions about vectors? All right. If you're going to take a take a picture of the board, I would do so now because I'm about to erase it. I am, of course, also video recording this. Of course, I will try to get the video out before the test. So, when it comes to things like ray casting, I am not, I'm going to try not to have you memorize how particular methods are called, and like what arguments go in what location, all right? Declaring things that's on the table, right? Creating a new vector, you gotta know how to do that. But with respect to memorizing the specific like sequence of code which performs a raycast, that's not what I want out of you guys on the test. Okay? However, <clears throat> you should be able to answer for me what these operations Describe to me what these operations do. So we've got two operations. Debug dot draw ray, and we've got <coughs> physics dot raycast. What do these do? Let's start with debug dot draw ray. It creates a ray where? So, uh, not, um, not necessarily, right? That's an option that's actually configurable. In our examples, we set it so that the ray was drawn from the, uh, from the location of the object to which the script was attached, right? But there's no reason, like there are ways to offset that. But um, so that's not like, that's not the where I was looking for. Nope. Yes? That's specified where you um, put You would put in this. So think about, think about the Unity development, bar, development environment, right? Which view do you have to look through to get the debug rays? Yes, the scene and not the game view. So, debug rays, draw a ray in the scene view, invisible through
How about a physics ray cast? What is a ray casting operation? It would essentially test to see if it collides with an object. All right. Test to see if what collides with an object? A vector. A vector? Yeah, vectors and rays are basically identical. So I would give you full marks on a test if you said vector instead of uh, instead of ray. Yeah. You had something to add? Okay. So physics dot ray cast calculates the intersection of a ray or vector with colliders in the scene. Simple enough, right? So a ray cast is an interaction with the physics of the game. Uh, or at least it's an interaction with the geometry of the game. It doesn't actually do anything physical, right? Um, it doesn't add forces or move pieces or do anything. It doesn't have any effect on the physics going on. All it is is a geometric calculation. Another important thing about physics raycast returns hit slash not hit. You can also extract a reference to the thing that was hit, but I think we skipped over that part in class, so don't worry about it. But uh, yeah, you can, you can um, with a raycast, you can return a reference to the object that the raycast intersected so that you can, like, you know, modify a particular property of something. So, like, one thing that you use raycasts for, like, actually, so let's imagine that you are in a, uh, like, a first-person shooter game, right? Um, at least this is the way that, like, first-person shoot shooters up to a certain complexity and using certain approximations will work. Like, if the first-person shooter assumes that the bullets don't travel in an arc as they actually do in physics, but like travel along a straight line relative to the direction that you click, then there's no, there's no difference between a bullet shot and a ray cast, right? So if you have the main camera projecting a view, right? Um, and if this is your screen, right? If you have like a cursor or something, and you click on a certain point, there is a function that you can use that draws a ray through the point of the mouse click, at which point you can like cast that ray through, if you have like several objects, right? that ray cast will intersect this particular object. The script can get a reference to that particular object, and you can do something to it specifically, color it, or you know, whatever operation you want to do. Apply a force to punch it in the direction, make the enemy soldier's head explode, whatever you want to do. Uh, and like this is basically how clicking on something works in a three-dimensional environment, right? This is what underlies the Unity method uh, mouse down, right? So good so far it goes. That's not review for the test. That's just like, an extra topic. So understand the difference between debug rays and raycasts. I will. Uh, Wait a moment for you to take a photo if you want to take a photo. Cool. Next topic.
Okay. What do you guys want to do next? Switch cases. Anybody else? Anything? We should do conditionals before we do switch cases. Any other ideas? Any other ideas? In that case, I will start with conditionals. So, conditional statements in actually pretty much all programming languages that you'll probably ever use are also known as if statements. So, recall the flowchart for an if statement. is the classic if-else construction. If condition C, statement 1, else, statement 2, there we go. In addition, the else case is optional. classic if with no else case. If you fail on the condition, you simply rejoin execution after the statement. If C S Not good. Finally, we have if else if else. C1 Yes, S1, no, C2, yes, S2, S1, no, sense? So, the way that the if-else works, you first encounter the C1 condition. You first encounter the C1 condition. If that condition comes out true, you execute the first branch. If it doesn't, you then perform a second task, C2. If that condition comes out true, you execute this branch. Otherwise, you execute that branch. Does that make sense? Now, a switch case.
x is equal to what? Double equal to. So, in the case of the switch statement, we are testing to see if x is equal to some options, right? We also uh, optionally include a case to catch it if none of these came out true. If you don't include an uh, a default case, then you just slip back in and do nothing uh, after uh, basically none of these statements execute if there's no default case. If, for example, otherwise said or then otherwise would be down here. So, I'm going to put here. So here we would have switch which x case one s one break case two s two break case Does that make sense? Any questions? Is there going to be a written question saying this is the complete switch case and the statement? Well, that would be quite a good test question, wouldn't it? What is the difference between a switch case and an next statement? Flexible, fast. You have a question? No, I was trying to what I Oh, oh, okay. 
Well, what, what were you going to say? Uh, I was just going to say that the student case was not in Again, yeah. Same distinction, right? That's a good point, though. Um, you can easily construct an if statement condition to say something like, x is less than 5 and y is greater than 7. You're introducing two variables into the test. Whereas, that is again impossible in the switch case. Um, if you are going to only learn one of the two of these and use that for the rest of your programming career, which one should it be? How many people think if statement? How many people think switch case? Very good. Everybody's paying attention. So, uh, I think that'll just about do it for conditionals. Unless you have a question. I just want to be clear. So, those things is for like most of the ladies, most of the cases are going to use for Yeah. Um, if you're looking to switch between different specific values, then use a switch case. Right? But um, if you need conditions very generally, then you want to have a statement. Um, I'll give you guys a moment to take a picture, uh, if you want to take a picture, and then we shall move right along.
write values into it, and you read values from it. Right? So, let's review declaration, reading, and writing. So, to declare a variable, you need one very important piece of information. What is it? Uh, well, you do need that, yes. But um, you need a, an important piece of information about the variable you are declaring, yes. Actually, no. Technically speaking, you don't. You don't need a value at the time of declaration. You probably want one before you try to read from it. Yes? Yes, you need to know the data type. Data type, yes. So we need to know how much memory to set aside for it. Therefore, we need to know how much memory this thing should occupy. Therefore, we need to know the data type. What are our data types? Just call them out. Integer. Double. Float. What else? Boolean. What else? String. String. I forget if it's capitalized in C sharp. I don't think it is actually. In Java, it's capitalized. Um, there are some other ones, but hmm? those are your decimals. Bigger double? Yeah. Like a long double? It was on our quiz for um, the question about medical expenses. extended size floating point number. So float is a 32 bit. I can actually find you new. Bits. Ints are 32. Doubles are 64. Floats are 32. You'd think that Boolean would be one bit, but as a matter of fact, they're normally stored in like whatever your lowest size that's bigger than one. And it has to do with like the way the memory is addressed. You can only read memory out of RAM in like whole bytes, right? So you'd have to use at least eight bytes for a Boolean. So we'll just pencil eight in for now. And then a string is, uh, you know, uh, you know. Strings are a variable size. Although a reference to a string is always a fixed size, nevertheless. Um, yeah, there are also things like long int, which is 64 bits, and short int, which is 16 bits. But you can tell that we're working on a computer right now because all of these numbers are base 2, right? All of these are 2 raised to some power. Make sense? So, um, how do you declare a variable syntactically? Like in code, how would you declare one? I said declare, not initialize. Yeah, you don't need the equal sign. Yeah. So think about um, when we've declared public and private variables at the class level, very often there's no equal sign there, right? So you can declare separately 
from an instantiate to zero. So, declaration x is equal to 7. Let's write another line of code here. Say z is equal to x uh, plus 5. Here, is x being written to or read from? It's being read from. Is z being written to or read from? It's being written to. Very good. So. When you have a uh, basic assignment statement like this, everything on the uh, left-hand side is right operation. Everything on the right-hand side is read operations. And you can have multiple read operations, but each line will only have one, at most one right operation. Does that make sense? Any other questions about variables? Perhaps we should talk about public versus private? Um, I am not looking for a formal object-oriented style definition for public and private here. Uh, just give me your uh, impressions. Like, how have public and private been used so far? Yes? Yes. Okay. So what's the effect of declaring public versus private? In the inspector, 
Private variables don't. And that's about as much as I'm interested in you guys knowing about public versus private variables, actually. At our present level of understanding of object-oriented systems. Sound good? Okay. Um, what is an integer? A whole number, positive and negative. What are floats and doubles? Decimal numbers, that's right. What is a boolean? True false value. What is a string? Text or a collection of characters. Yeah. And don't worry about the other ones. Good. All right. So far, so good. I'll give you guys a moment to uh, take a photo of that because we will move on to our next topic. chart for a while loop. Well, you would have to replace S and C with other things, but yes. So, if you'd like an example, loop that counts to 10, right? We have an integer 0, our integer n is equal to 0. Less than or equal to 
10. Um, console dot write line. Just going to say print and but it's console dot write line n. n is equal to n plus one or n plus equals one or n plus plus all valid forms. And that is the loop. What you will get in your output is 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. Do we get 10? Will 10 print? Yeah. Exactly. So yes, 10 prints in this case. So here's a question. If I swap these two, what do I get? one would be the first. Very good. You'd shift the entire range down by one. Very good. So, does that make sense? So now, let's um, modify it slightly to take a sum. Let's sum all of the numbers between one and ten. Or whichever range of numbers this happens to be. Right? Int sum, what's a good initial value for a sum? What's a number that you add to anything and it's the number that you added it to? Zero, yes. The reason we use zero is because you can add zero to anything and it's still, it's, it's just the thing you added it to, it doesn't affect the sum at all. So, that's the only number with that property, folks. So,
to have subsequent questions on the test depend on correct answers to previous ones, right? Because, you know, basically, you know, if you have a question with parts A through F and you screw up on part B and then you lose the rest of the marks on the question, um, is this fairness? Probably not. So, let's trace this program, shall we? Line one, what are we doing? Yep, what, but what do I write in the chart? Sum, sum is zero. Line two, what do I do? N is also zero, okay. Testing condition, is N less than or equal to 10? You know what, I'm gonna make this uh, three. <laughs> just so this is a much shorter program. And that's exactly the sort of thing I would do on a test too. I wouldn't have to do out of like all of this all the way to 10. So, is zero less than or equal to three? Yes. So, we move to the next line. Four, uh, line four. Sum is equal to sum plus n. What is sum? What is n? So, zero plus zero is? Zero. Sum is zero. N is equal to n plus one. What is n? What is 0 plus 1? What is n? 1. So, when you are producing a trace like this, even though we have overwritten sum with its same value, I want to see both zeros. Because it's an indication that that operation took place and that you didn't skip it. Don't skip anything if you're doing a trace. Don't skip anything. Because you know the bug is going to be the spot that you skipped. Every time. Murphy's Law. So, do uh, you guys know what Murphy's Law is? Yes? Exactly. So Murphy's Law is, if anything can go wrong, it will. Do you know what the first amendment to uh, Murphy's Law is? Anything that can't go wrong, So, we, turn, we finish this iteration of the loop, pop up, back up to the top. n is, is 1 less than or equal to 3? Yes, so? So we do the loop. Sum is equal to sum plus n. What is sum? What is n? So sum is equal to, good. What is n? What is 1 plus 1? Glad everybody caught that. <laughs> um, and we write 2 back to n. Go back up to the top. What is n? 2 is less than or equal to 3. Correct. So we run. What is sum? What is, well, what is sum? Good. What is n? What is 1 plus 2? So we write that to sum. What is n? What is, uh, yes, what is n plus 1? So we write that to n. Is n less than or equal to 3? So we run the loop. What is sum? What is n? What is 3 plus 3? We write that back. What is n? What is n plus 1? We write that back. There we go. What is n? Is n less than or equal to 3? Or is 4 less than or equal to 3? So, we stop. We quit the loop. Very good. If I ask you to trace the program on a test, producing that chart and that chart exactly, we'll get you full marks for a problem of this kind. Make sense? I'd probably make that a three-mark question. It wouldn't be much harder than this. Like this is, for a lot of you folks, this is your first, your absolute first like exposure to programming. You know, I can't completely crush you yet. 
No, like if I uh, if I were to do this, um, you know, I might make the operators a little more interesting. You know, this is about as dead simple as a loop can get. You know, I do I wouldn't give you this exact program on the test, right? Uh, I didn't just give you an answer to the test, but um, yeah. Uh, so a little bit a little bit confounded, but you know, I probably wouldn't give you one that was more than six or seven lines of code. Because, like, fundamentally, like, actually, like, being able to trace a program like this means that you understand how the code works, right? So this is actually quite a good test of your, uh, your programming knowledge to be able to trace a program. Of course, another good test is can you write a program, right? But, um, anyway, I think I've said enough. <laughs> you, you folks get the point, I think. Um, any other questions? Okay. I'll give you a moment to uh, take your photographs. Although, honestly, for that one, the video will probably be more useful to you. Um. Oops. All right. And you wanted operators, right? Can I erase the board? Good. All right. Do you feel like this is useful as a study session? Is there anything I could be doing better? No? Okay. I, I, I like to check in every once in a while. Because like, if there's this brand new way of doing a test review that I'm not aware of, I'd be happy to try it. At the expense of all of the time for the existing test review, of course. Yeah. So, operator is down. So, fortunately, operators work very similarly to algebra as you know it, right? Operators slash expressions. If I were to give you an expression like 5 plus 7 times 3, you would be able to calculate that because that's great school stuff, right? So with operators inside of a computer, your standard Betmas rules are a big check. That still works. What's interesting is that we have introduced some additional operators, and one in particular, division, works slightly differently than you are used to. So, let's start with division. Divide. X divide by Y. Alright? How this, like what form of division this is, depends on the data types of the things going in. So, what are the two types of division? Sure, yes. So, yeah, I'm getting there. I'm getting there. So, Division can be either integer division or decimal division. By the way, the word decimal does not mean what you think it does, but ask me when I'm not doing a test review. 
um, decimal means base 10. Uh, so, like, all the, like, the presence of the decimal point in a number means people think of this as a decimal number, but there are many, many numbers that are not, that, that don't have a decimal point that are decimal numbers. Like 1001 is a decimal number, though it does not have a decimal point, right? And is in fact an integer, right? So the way that I usually state it, if I'm trying to be more formal and mathematical, is that if you have a number with multiple digits after the decimal point, you are dealing with something with a fractional component. So you have the fractional component, and you have the, oh man, I can't do a curly brace backwards. There we go. Then you have the whole number component. Decimal, big and obvious decimal point. Right? So anything that's a fraction of a whole number is in the fractional component. The reason that I, I put it in there and I'm calling the fractional component is, like, like, technically I shouldn't be because technically this also includes irrational numbers, right? To say it's a fractional component implies that the, the number is rational. You guys know the difference between rational and uh, irrational numbers? specifically. 
So, floating point division keeps a decimal place, keeps the fractional component, right? Integer division drops the fractional component. Note, it doesn't round the fractional component, it drops the fractional component. Another way of putting this is it truncates the, fra the fractional component. So, whether you are in a Integer, integer division scenario or a floating point division scenario is dependent on what? How does the computer pick between these two forms of division? The what's of the variables? What about variables? So close! Yes! It depends on the data type of the inputs. That's right! So, if both x and y are int, division is integer float otherwise. Make sense? So the reason that the computer does it this way is it likes to avoid the truncation, right? So it's not going to send a number which might have a valid fractional component into a scenario where any information stored there will be dropped just by the fact that you're performing a division on it will choose a floating point if either or both of these numbers are floating point. And floating point here also includes doubles, double precision floating point. Right? So, if I have, um, let's say, int x and int y, But x is equal to 3, y is equal to 4, and I calculate int z is equal to y divided by x. What is z? z equals what? So yes, it's it's four divided by three. What is z? Yes. One. Remember, two integers in. Four divided by three drop the fractional component. This would normally be 1.333, etc. But because the two inputs are integer, the fractional component is dropped. Question? the remainder of integer division. So in this case, what is the modulus? Also one, right. Incidentally, mod also works on, uh, on floating point numbers, which is kind of fun. But uh, like, if you want shorthand on a double for give me just the fractional component of this, you can say, you know, uh, f mod 1 
And then if f is like 37.332, uh, f mod 1 will be just 0 0.332, which is kind of fun. Neat little trick. So, new scenario. Let's say that I have int x equals, uh, maybe, 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 say, 11 float y is equal to 3. Um, float z is equal to x divided by y. What is z in this scenario?
to say 10 is also to say 10.0. Right? The other way, you have to lose information so the computer will complain. Does that make sense? Numbers? Numbers good? Numbers yes? Everybody like numbers? Me like numbers. So, um, so much for division. Um, There are some other operators, less interesting operators. Um, you have your comparison of, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to erase this bit. You have comparators or comparison operators. What are our comparison operators? Equals equals double ampersand exclamation mark equals plus equals not yes did you do all the ones that uh, anybody else comparison operators yes less than greater than less than greater than oh. and you could also check that to reverse it you could also add equals t to that as well. Greater than equals, less than equals. Yes. This is not a comparator. This is a logical operator. And what's the other one? operator which negates a boolean value. How do you turn true to false and false to true? It's not. Exclamation point. If you put an exclamation point in front of a boolean value, it'll turn true to false and false to true. It does the same thing here. Yeah. So, equality comparison. Inequality comparison. Greater than, less than, greater than equals, less than equals, and, or, and not. And, or, not. And that'll do for now. There are more, but, you know, that'll do for now. So, um, any questions about operators? Is it clear to everyone how these things work?
That's true, but color changing won't take very long. Um, so, once again, this is another one where I'm less concerned that you can reproduce the code which performs the operation. In any real scenario, you would have, like, the drop-down list of what, what the method's names actually are, right? What's important here is to understand navigating the object's uh, hierarchy, right? So, describe to me the process of changing the color. Let's assume that the, well, okay, let's back up. How do you set an object up so that you can change its color? Uh, you've spoken basically not at all today. How about you? Um, object material, uh, the name is the code. Uh, uh, Where does material come from? You break in the project by assets and then materials. Good. So, step one. Create material in assets. Step two, attach material to what? The script. Not the script, not the engine. Object. What? Object. The objects, what components of the object? Mesh renderer, that's right. To mesh renderer. Now, that's in the Unity interface. Now in the script. Right? How do we get at an object's color property? Through a script. Yes. Yes. Reference this game object. This dot game. Object. Forgive my capitalizations if they're off. I know how picky the unity, unity is about capitalization. So this dot game object. Where do you go from there? What do you have to get to? Yes. The mesh renderer. Yes. Reference. Mesh. line of code
Now what do you do? So we've got access to the material. Color is a property of the material. How do we access a property of something?
short break. Uh, short breaks are good. If you find yourself not being able to read the page because you're tired, you should stop, take a short nap, or a rest, come back to it. Um, like studying and interval training are like like not a bad combo, you know. But uh, yeah, anything else that I have to say? Um, I try. I will try not to make it too hard on it. We'll get all of you. Um, it's it's very difficult though, as a person who's like so deeply versed in programming. Like it's kind of like you know the game Shadow of the Colossus. Well, I'm the Colossus, and you guys are the little guys that are crawling all over me. So it's it's very easy for me to like make a wrong movement and just destroy you. So I have to I have to move very slowly and ponderously through this material, um, at least in, in the case of a test. In a lesson, it's like you know I can say stuff and people just kind of ignore it, ignore it if they don't know what I'm talking about, so it works out. But uh, you know if I'm expecting things from you, I will try to keep things simple. This is after all your first foray into the wide world of programming. But yes. Um, Sometimes very tempting to say, ask a question that's too hard. But, you know, I'll try to resist the temptation. 